So this week's parsha is Parshas Chayi Sara, which literally means the life of Sarah, um, which is interesting considering that the parsha actually begins talking about the passing of Sora. Um, anyways, that's another whole discussion in itself, which I'd love to get into, but it's not on the schedule. And if I do get into it, it's going to take the whole class. So we're not going to go there, but we're going to have a look at when the Torah talks about Sora passing away. It says, I'm going to read from the text, but Thomas Sora and Sora passed away. Bekiryas Arba and Kiryas Arba he Chevrin, which is Chevrin, Be'eretz Um So, uh, th- that's literally what the verse means. And we're going to have a look at when the, there's a Zohar, an interpretation of this in the Zohar. It says, and this is the second paragraph. The Zohar says what this means, or and one of the things that this Pasuk is addressing, talking about is Vatomas. Okay, so when it says Sora, obviously Sora literally means Sora, the matriarch, the first matriarch of the Jewish people. And her husband was Avraham. And when it talks about Avraham and Sora, Avraham and Sora are obviously iconic, very iconic individuals in Judaism. They are the first Jewish couple. They are the two first Jews. So, they are metaphors for a number of things. In addition to being actual individuals, people who lived, they are also going to be metaphors for a number of things. And one of the things that they are metaphors for, particularly in the context of this verse which talks about Sarah passing away and Avram coming to mourn the passing of Sarah, his wife, is that Sarah is a metaphor for the body of an individual and Avraham is a metaphor for the soul. Now, Avram and Sarah were a couple. A couple, a couple. So a couple is comprised of two individuals, but when those two individuals become a couple. They have become one collective entity, which is comprised of two elements that make it up. So a couple isn't just two people. It's an entity that is comprised of two individuals. So when two individuals become a couple, they become a new singular collective entity that's comprised of them both. The same is true of every individual in terms of the body and the soul. So every single one of us has a body and a soul. Without the soul, just the body wouldn't be alive. It would just effectively be steak, pretty much. And a soul without a body would be a... A soul is a spiritual entity. A soul isn't a physical entity. So without a body, the soul wouldn't be a person. The soul would be at least it would resemble more closely an angel than a person. A soul is a non-physical entity, a spiritual entity, as an angel is a non-physical entity, a spiritual entity. So a soul on its own without a body would not, a soul isn't an angel. A soul of a human being is a soul that's specifically designed to give life to a human body, a homo sapiens animal body, and is brought to life and enlivened by a homo sapiens animal soul. It's not an angel. But if we could see it, relate to it, it would appear probably, let's say, more, it would resemble an angel more strongly than it resembles a human being as we know it, because a human being by definition is a body and a soul combined. A soul on its own isn't physical, doesn't physically exist technically. So a person is a combination of body and soul. Avraham is a metaphor for the soul. Sora is a metaphor for the body. So now, you know what, let me write this down. So for Thomas, Sora, Bikirias Arba, (laughs) 
we always think like this, that then in in every pair, woman is uh, in every pair, woman is a body and the man. It's 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 a correct analogy. So there, in the relationship between body and soul, there are things about the role of the body relative to the soul which are feminine in nature, and things about the role of the soul relative to the body which are masculine in nature. It doesn't mean that men are more spiritual and women are more material. The truth is, in contrast, if you look at the texts of Judaism, generally women are described as being on one hand more practical but also more in touch with spirituality which is why the emphasis on men to have to pray etc etc is much stronger because men um being the way that men tend to be relative to women need a little more work on their spiritual on their being spiritually oriented, let's say. Um, But in terms of, it's talking about not necessarily spirituality versus material and men are more spiritual, women are more, more physically oriented. It's talking about the role in terms of the relationship between them. So in the relationship between body and soul, the soul generally is considered to be the more masculine element in that interaction between body and soul, and the body is considered to be the more feminine element in the relationship between the, the interactions between the body and the soul. So here, literally, this means by Thomas Sora, Sora died, by Kyrias Arba, he Hevrain. In Kyrias Arba, which is Hevrain. Arba means four. So by Thomas Sora, the body. Sora is, an, is a metaphor for the body. So the body dies. Bekiryas Arba. Arba means four. This body which is comprised of four elements. Sorry, excuse me. Now, when we talk about elements, this can be very... There's a lot of room for misunderstanding because we talk in... in, in, in sort of, you know, centuries-old texts of Torah, there's talk about the four elements, Esh, Ruach, Mayim, Afar, fire, air, earth, and water. And then, you know, obviously, we'll, we know today that there aren't four elements. There's 120-ish elements, 100 and change natural elements, and then there's synthetic ones that we've managed to make. We have a periodic table. There's not four elements. That's primitive but the question is, what do they mean? What are they referring to? I actually went on this uh, kind of a bit of a rant as a tangent in a different class last week. I don't think I've done it here for a while. And it's important. Um, Torah and science. Right? So, obvious, th- there are going to be, disclaimer, there are going to be times when Torah and science are going to be in conflict. But I think that the actual incidence of a real conflict between them is a lot less than what a lot of people like to make it out to be. So you'll have obviously many people who'd like to jump to the conclusion, oh, Torah says this, science says that, so obviously Torah is wrong, it doesn't get it. And you'll have people on the other side who love to say, well, Torah says this and science says that, so science is wrong, they don't know what they're talking about, Torah says something else. I... I don't know whether the number is 90% or 99% or 99.9%, but I would suggest that I I believe very strongly that the vast majority of those times, or it depends for who, but the times that people like to jump to a conclusion that one or the other is wrong because they're at loggerheads, if you stop to actually, first of all, understand what is the science actually saying and what does it mean? Not what's the title in Men's Health magazine based on a distortion of what the research says so that they can sell more supplements, but what does the research actually say and what does it actually mean? What does it actually indicate? What's the Torah actually saying? What's the Chassidus actually saying? And as particularly when it comes to Chassidus more than, let's say, Halacha, Gemara, etc., because it's talking about abstract things, there are many layers of depth to understand what it's actually saying versus the most basic layer of analogies that are used. 
So if we stop and try to understand, well, what's it actually saying? What's the actual idea? What does it actually mean? And what does the science actually say? And not assume that there's a mitzvah to jump to the conclusion that they're contradicting each other and therefore one is wrong and depending on what side of the aisle you're on, that'll be which one's right and which one's wrong. But to stop and say, well, maybe they're not contradicting each other. Maybe they're talking about two different things. Maybe it's context specific. Maybe once you understand what each one's actually saying, it doesn't have to be a contradiction anymore. And there are many, many, many examples where you actually see this, that there are well-known statements that people have to jump to conclusions and say, well, this one's wrong or that one's wrong. And if you stop and think, you can sort of understand how there's not a contradiction. And then if you, as your recognition of the texts gets broader and broader, you'll see in some place that's not so well-known that it actually explains exactly that idea that it's not a contradiction. And if you would understand what it's saying, it's actually these words actually mean this and this idea and it's not contradictory at all. So I'm not a big fan of jumping to the conclusion that there is a contradiction and that one or the other is wrong. The question is, what are they both saying? Now, when we talk about four elements, it doesn't mean that there's no hydrogen, helium, etc., etc., etc. I could list, I think I can go up to about 30 on the periodic table. We're not, the four elements is not a contradiction. It's not arguing with the periodic table of the elements. It's talking about four general tendencies in nature. And approximately speaking, we have heavy versus light, warm versus cold, dry versus moist. And we have earth, wind, air, fire, and water. So we have different poles and combinations of these tendencies. And everything that exists in nature has different combinations of these tendencies. So elements doesn't mean, because we use the same word, these four elements, and the elements on the periodic table are referred to as elements, we assume that one is a contradiction to the other. But it's, it, the question is, what are they talking about? It's the, the different ideas, but for both of which we use the word element to refer to, because despite the fact that, if I'm not mistaken, English actually has the most words out of any known language, it still might not have necessarily enough words to have a specific noun for every single thing. So there are these four elements that everything's comprised of, these four tendencies that all of the universe is made up of, both physically and spiritually. So when Sarah dies, Sarah, the body, which is comprised of Araba, of these four elements, of these four natural tendencies of physical matter, all of physical matter, has different combinations of these four tendencies, these elements of existence, he chevroin, these four tendencies or elements, which are chibur, which are connected whilst the body is alive. So when a person is alive, the body is held together, all the elements of the body, and it can be observed. I mean, it's not pretty. It's not pretty to see and it's not pretty to talk about, but it's a fact of life. After a person becomes deceased, the body decomposes. And that, you know, let's say that the the carbon that was in the body primarily, roughly speaking, just very generally, will be reabsorbed into the ground. The water primarily will probably evaporate, etc., and go back into the atmosphere. So the various parts of the body that make it up Once the person's deceased, they separate and go different ways because the body's not alive anymore. But whilst the body is alive, the elements that make up the body, chevrin, are connected. They're joined together. So here what we're seeing is that in this interpretation of the Zohar, of this verse, it's talking about Sarah being the body. The body passes away. Now what happens next? That Thomas Sarah, Sarah passed away. Avraham Avraham came to eulogize Sarah and to mourn her, to cry. Why would the soul, the soul which is purpose-oriented, spiritually oriented, the soul wants to bring spirituality into the world, wants to elevate the physical and make it more spiritually oriented. Why is the soul crying once the body's gone? The soul's free. It's not limited and restricted by, by, by material anymore. Why is the soul crying? 
so we're going to go on a bit of a tangent. This is not my tangent. This is a tangent actually in the text for a change. Um, so there's a verse that says, Kisira Hamar Sainacha. I'm going to write the actual translation on top of it and then we'll do the, the alternative interpretation underneath. Hamar Sainacha. Reveitz Tachas Masai. Vachadalta. Let's make me sure let me make sure that I've got that right. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so Kisira, when you will see you will see. Hamar the donkey. Soinacha of your enemy. Well, literally the one who you hate, but let's call it enemy. Rovitz is crouching or struggling. Let's call it struggling for the just co- sake of context. Tachas Masai under its load. And you will literally hold back. Let's call it hesitate. And you will refrain is probably a better word. Refrain from helping. The Pasuk gives an injunction, a direction. You shall help with him, i.e. with your enemy. You shall help the donkey. So the Torah is telling us human nature, right? There's someone who you can't stand and possibly for, for, for good reason, for justifiable reason, it can happen that there are people whose behavior can make them difficult to like. And you see them and they're walking down the street and they're going with their donkey and their do- donkey's ca- carrying some um, some stuff, whatever it is. And it's a big load the donkey's carrying and it's struggling and it's kind of crouching down and having a hard time. And the, the, the package could drop and then getting the pack back onto the donkey could be super hard. So the inclination of a person who sees someone that they really don't like, unless they're very, very grounded and in the right perspective will not infrequently, let's say, be to say, ha ha, sucks to be you, bye, deal with it, right? So if you see, when you will see the donkey of your enemy, of someone who you don't like, struggling under its load, and you will refrain from helping, i.e. you will be inclined to refrain from helping, the Torah says, no, you shall help. Now, Oh boy, I didn't really leave much room there, did I? Um, okay, so I'm just going to... Is there another color marker here? No, there isn't. Um, okay, we'll have a quick look here. If not, we'll just figure it out. Okay, so Kisira, now we're going to give an alternative interpretation of this verse. And this is the way the Baal Shem Tov explains it. Kisira, when you will see, Hamar comes from... There's a word in Hebrew, Chumrius. Well, chaymer. Chaymer, chaymer means matter or mass. Chaymer means a simple mass, matter. Chumriyus, we could call perhaps materialness. Kisira chamer, when you will see this materialness, you'll see that you have a soul and you have a body. <coughs> and the purpose of life is to strengthen our spiritu- spiritually orientedness. Our purpose in life is to uplift the world and make it spiritual. Our purpose in life is to bring divinity into the world, make the world a better place. And we wake up in the morning and we're thinking about ice creaming, and we're thinking about football, and we're thinking about cars, etc., etc. We're thinking about whatever it is. We're thinking about Instagram. 
And then we stop and think, well, you know what? Like, no. I'm supposed to be, I'm here about the spirituality. I'm here for my purpose. That's what this is about. And this material side of me, this chumrios, my materially orientedness that I have and that I can't get rid of, soinacha, it's my enemy. I hate it. It's getting in the way and it's stopping me from being who I'm supposed to be. Kisira chamor, when you see that chumrios, this materialness, soinacha is your enemy. And what's your enemy doing? What's your materialness, your body, the material materially oriented part of us. What's it doing? Rovets tachos masai. It's struggling. It's struggling to keep what's the load? What's the load of the body? Torah, mitzvahs. I have to learn Torah. I have to daven. I have to keep kosher. I have to keep Shabbos. It's so hard. It's so hard. And it can be, depending on perspective. If a person... You know, Torah Judaism basically, not basically, affects every single moment of life. Now, if a person's perspective towards the importance and value of that, of Torah, of mitzvahs, of the purpose, why we're here, etc., is not quite on point with the perspective of Torah and mitzvahs, it can become very, very burdensome. It's a whole lot to carry. It's a whole lot to deal with. And if we're not really into it, it gets very hard. It does. It's a lot to carry and a lot to deal with. Now, the part of us that we're talking about now, specifically that we're addressing, is chamor, the chumrias, the materially oriented part of us, the body. The body that wants to stay in bed for a little longer. The body that wants to eat more good food and hang out and have a good bit of gossip instead of going to do what we need to do. Etc, etc, etc. The chumrius. And we see it as our enemy, the enemy of our purpose and why we're here. And we hate it. And it is struggling under its load because Torah and Mitzvah can be a big load when we're not in the zone, when we're not... When our emotional self isn't aligned, let's say, with our intellectual or academic self. So we believe it's true. We know it's true, which is why we're doing it, but we're not really feeling it. It can become a lot to carry. It can become very tedious. So what do we do? You're not going to help the body. You're not going to strengthen the body. You're going to say, yes, body, soinacha, you are my enemy. Material orientedness, the material nature, the materialistic part of, not materialistic, but more material part of who I am is the enemy of my purpose, the enemy of my mission, the enemy of why I'm here. And I'm going to oppose it. And this kind of can make sense. Can kind of make sense. It can seem to make sense. And this has been actually a big part of the, big part of the approach for many sincere, good-hearted, hard-working Torah observant Jews over centuries and centuries is to try to wear down the body wear down the material orientedness of the body, wear down the body itself as much as possible, punish the body so that the soul can break through and shine. And remember that the way that the Pasuk reads in the literal sense is when you will see this donkey struggling, you will be inclined to refrain from helping. Pause, comma, and then the Pasuk says, that is incorrect. Ozov tazov imoy, go help. And the, that, the way that it's broken up here is the same. When you look at your materialness, you look at your body and you see enemy. The material side of who I am, the material part of my body is my enemy because I'm supposed to be here about spirituality. I want to break it. I want to say, yes, you're struggling under your load. Deal with it. Deal with it. Get your act together. Don't be so materially oriented. 
You can struggle and you can have a hard time and then maybe, maybe you'll, you'll eventually break through and start to be a little less materialistic in nature. The Baal Shem Tov says, the Pasuk says, no. Azov Tazov Imo. The correct way to go about this is to help, to assist the body. The question obviously is, what does that mean? And it's very um, context specific. But generally speaking, let's take a step back. Why is it that Torah and mitzvahs, a, a Torah observant lifestyle for someone who's not really feeling it is so burdensome? Because there's so much to do. Every, almost every single thing you do throughout the day has what the Torah, you know, meddles and tells us how to do it and what, what part of it we should do and what we shouldn't do and how we should do it. Why? Why does the Torah have to mix into such little details of mundane things? What does the Torah care how I do mundane things? And the answer is, um, oh, and another question also, by the way, going back. The Torah also, Hashem says to Avram Avinu, when Avram Avinu disagreed with something that Sarah had suggested, Hashem says, Kol Sarah, whatever Sarah tells you, Shma Bekoila, listen to her. Listen to her voice. So now that we have in the context of body and soul, with Avram being the soul and Sarah being the body, it seems a little bit counterintuitive that Hashem would say to the soul, to the neshama, by the way, whatever the body tells you, listen. That seems to go against every, everything that we know about personal development from the perspective of Torah, which is to try to not be managed and ruled by the materialistic nature and the materially oriented nature of the human body. There's nothing wrong with the fact that the body is materially oriented. That's the way it's designed. It's designed to be like that. Our purpose, the purpose for which we are here as a body-soul composite entity, let's call it, as a couple that's made up of body and soul, Avram and Sarah, is to work on that and to make progress. And to develop the body and to become less material oriented. So how is it that on one hand we're saying the whole in, in, a, in a, to a degree, one of the primary purposes, let's say, of life is for the soul throughout the course of its tenure in the body to work on developing the body and making the body a little, little less materialistic, a little less materially oriented, etc., a little more refined, a little more spiritually oriented, and hopefully over the course of life, a lot more. Spiritually oriented, a lot less materialistic. Now, if that's what we say that a large one of the primary purposes of life is, how is Hashem then going and telling the soul, whatever the body tells you, listen? Now, that seems to fit with the way the Baal Shem Tov is reading this verse, that when you see your body and you recognize it as your enemy, the material nature of your body and you see it as your enemy and it's struggling under the load of Torah and mitzvahs and your natural inclination as someone who is concerned with spiritual self-development is to say deal with it eventually you'll get over all of this material stuff and hopefully you'll actually grow up and become a little more spiritually oriented that may be the inclination that one has to say so the Pasuk says, no, Azov Tazov Imoy, help the body, help your material nature. Question is, what does that mean? Now, obviously, it's not a contradiction to what we say that one of the primary purposes of life is to develop the body and make it less materially oriented, etc. The question is, what is this saying and what's the balance and how does it work? So here we're saying that on one hand, the primary purpose of life is to to spiritually develop the body and make it less material oriented. On the other hand, we're saying, no, by the way, you should not neglect your body, the material nature, you should help it. The question is, what's really going on? What's the balance of priorities of body, of soul? What are they both doing here? And hopefully we'll be able to understand and get to the conclusion to understand 
the balance of on one hand, the primary purpose is to make the body less materially oriented. On the other hand, we're saying don't break the body, help the body out, get it out of its being stuck, get it out of a situation in which it's struggling. Don't encourage it to struggle and deal with it and get broken and support the health of the body, of the material, materialness of the body. Now I'm going to actually go sort of off script and give the background and foundation of the of of the answer and the idea, um, because I think that's really what it's what it's really all about. So it actually says that La Osid Lava in the time of Mashiach, we're actually going to see how now we say, generally speaking, what we say is that the soul makes the body alive. You have a body which would just be meat, and then the soul partners with the body and brings the body to life, makes the body alive. So it actually says that La'asid Lavi, we're going to see and experience how the body actually gives life to the soul. And it's actually in reverse. And the soul is actually getting its life source from the body. Now, how does it make sense that a spiritual entity is receiving its life from something material, which is in and of itself, let's say, to an extent, spiritually dead, but that's being the source of life for the spirituality. So first of all, obviously, we have to understand what's the, the big picture purpose of everything in the, gr- in the grand scheme of things. So the purpose of all existence is, it says in the Medrash, why did Hashem create the world? Hashem wanted to have a dwelling place in a physical world. So in order for there to be a dwelling place for divinity in a material world, there has to be a material world. We then have to bring divinity, bring godliness into the world. And as we continue to do that, cumulatively, we get to a point where we have made the physical world into a complete dwelling place for divinity, for God. Now, originally, going back before creation, there was just God, creator, that's it, divinity. Then God says, I want to have a physical world because I want to be made to live in that physical world. So we have a whole series of spiritual worlds that are created as stepping stones, as this process to get less and less in touch with divinity, less and less aware of the bigger picture until the final layer of that process is the material world that we know. Now, there's an expression in Loshna Kodesh, we say it in Davening on Friday night, Sof Maseh B'machshava Tchila. Sof Maseh, the end of the action, B'machshava Tchila is in the beginning of the thought. And what does that mean? Expression, right? You always find something in the last place you look. Now, the reason, obviously, why you find something in the last place you look is because when you find it, you stop looking. Were you ever looking for something and then you found it and you said, oh, let me keep looking anyway. I'm going to look in more places to see if I'll find it, even though I already found it. No. I hope not. Right? That's why, that's the people, obviously the intent of when people say you find something in the last place you look is because you you find something in the last place you think to look. The last place you think to look is where you're actually going to find it. When people say you find something in the last place you look, literally, that's because you stop looking when you find it. Why? Because your goal was to find the object. Your objective was to find this thing. Everything you do until you find it is a stepping stone to get there. Once you find the thing you wanted, once you've achieved your, achieved your objective, you stop the process that you put into place to get to your objective because you got there. Right? A simple analogy, I, w- I decide that I feel like ha- eating ice cream, which strictly speaking means I want to experience the sensation of having ice cream in my mouth. In order to experience that sensation, I have to have ice cream. I have to eat ice cream. To eat ice cream, I have to have ice cream. To have ice cream, I need to buy ice cream from the store, which means I have to get to the store and I have to have money to pay for it, which means that I need a means of transportation and I need a job to generate income so that I have money to buy the ice cream. So what's the first thing I do? I pursue a source of income. I pursue a source of transportation. Once I make money and I have a way to get there, It could be that the money is the way to get there because I'll pay for the subway or the Uber or whatever it is. I then take the transportation. 
which gets me to the store. I then buy the ice cream. I then put my ice cream in my mouth and eat it and experience the sensation of having ice cream in my mouth. So the, the order of the process is exactly opposite of the thought process. The first thing you think of is the objective. I want to experience the sensation of having ice cream in my mouth. That's the last thing you're going to, that's going to be the last step in the process by definition, because once you achieve that, you've got your objective. You're not continuing the process. So, Sof Maisa, the last thing you do by definition is the first thing that you thought of, because the place that you stop the process is where you reach your objective. You don't think about a process and then think about an object- objective. You know what? I'm going to go to the ice cream store. Why? You know what? Once I'm there, maybe I'll get some ice cream. Well, why would I get ice cream? Oh, it'll be fun to eat it too. That's a good idea said no one ever, right? You say, I want ice cream, I need to get ice cream, etc., etc., etc. So by definition, the order in which you plan for things is opposite, should be, if it's done strategically and properly, the opposite of the order in which you execute. Because the plan starts with the objective and then works back. The execution starts from where you are and works towards the objective. So what's the, what, what's the execution of creating the world? The first, the, the, it, let's call it Simsum Harishon. This God conceals himself. Whatever that means is another whole topic of discussion, but God conceals himself so that there is now room for this lack of awareness of God's presence. God's everywhere, but God creates the possibility to be unaware of his presence. God creates this pseudo-absence of God. Which then allows for this, for olamos. The word, Hebrew word for olam, for world is olam, which also is the word, comes from, is related to the word he'elem, which means concealment. A world is a concealment by definition because a world exists in an absence of complete recognition of the creator, which is what allows the self of the world to exist. And as there are subsequent increases in the reduction to which God's presence is apparent, God's presence doesn't become less, but it becomes less apparent. The extent to which these worlds have a sense of independent significance increases and increases more and more as you go down. And eventually you end up with the world that we know in which God's presence is not apparent at all. And at the very least, a large proportion of humanity denies that God exists, and understandably so. At least somewhat understandably so, to be fair. Um, Because the way that this world is allowed to exist is because God actively and intentionally conceals his existence. So the execution is, we have Tzimtzum, and we have the Kav, and we have Anam Kadmon, and I'm just throwing out terms that most of you probably aren't familiar with, just for the sake of illustration of the, the magnitude of the process. And we have Keser, and we have Atik, and Arech, and Atzilus, and the ten spheres of Atzilus. And then we have Keser of Bria, and ten spheres of Bria, and Keser of Yitzira, etc., etc., all the way down here. That's the execution. The process of, of evolving downwards ends here in the world that we know. You stop looking for something in the place that you find it. Why? Because you got your objective, so the process has come to an end. The process of creation stops when God gets to this world. There's no further, less in touch reality than the physical world that we know, because this is the objective. This was the point all along. The point of all those spiritual realities in between us and God was to get here. The point of having a job and having money and traveling to the ice cream store and buying the ice cream was to experience the sensation of having the ice cream in your mouth. That's why you stop, because you got your objective. The process of creation goes down, 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 down until it gets here. Because this is the objective. If this is the objective, once you achieve your objective, the process stops. So the process of creation stops because this was the ultimate creation that was the primary creation in the plan and intent all along. Sof Maaseh, the last action in terms of creation, Machshava Tchila was the entity that was originally thought of to create. Everything else was there as a stepping stone, an intermediate step to get here. 
Why? Because the whole purpose of existence is that Nisave HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Creator, desired to have a dwelling place in a physical world. The Creator wanted, by means of our ste- stepping up to challenges and achieving and following the guidelines of the Torah, to bring divinity, to bring the Creator into this physical world. Therefore, everything was created as an intermediate to get here so that that objective could be satisfied. So the objective of the creation, the immediate objective of the whole process of creation is the creation of this world. The objective of the creation of this world is to make it into a dwelling place for the creator. So, and and things here get very, very, can get kind of messy and confusing and blurry. Because on one hand, we're saying, so, so what is it that defines this world? The thing that defines this world as opposed to a spiritual world is being the most out of touch with the ultimate truth, which is that the creator is everywhere and everything comes from the creator. Everything is created constantly, intentionally by the creator for a purpose. That's the full truth. The defining element of this world as opposed to its spiritual precursors or spiritual counterparts is that this world has the least awareness of that. A, a minimal, close to zero natural awareness of the big picture and of the full truth. That's why this world is what it is. So obviously, on one hand, it's a noble pursuit to increase the awareness of the full truth. Now, it's a natural outcome of becoming more aware of the full truth that the more we realize, well, the materialism of the world is a result of a lack of awareness of the full truth, and that's deliberate and God made it that way, but... There is a bigger picture and a fuller truth than the one that we see. The world exists. It's not a fallacy, but it's only a small part of the truth. It's one layer in a very big, deep, profound, multidimensional truth. The more aware be- we become of the bigger picture and the many layers of that full truth, the less materially oriented we are going to be naturally because we see the value of the bigger picture. We see the material world as being an element in a bigger picture rather than being an end for itself. Naturally, it's going to fall into its role rather than being everything. Right? If someone has a position in a company that has 5,000 employees, a person gets hired and they're told, this is your job description, do it, do it, do it, focus on your job, focus on your job, focus on your job. A person could come to just like just not even be aware of the, all the other things that are going on around them. They're one out of 5,000 employees. Now, sometimes in very specific circumstances, it could be beneficial for the person to totally focus on what they're doing and lose track of everything else. But oftentimes what happens is, when a person also has to interact with other people and has to respect the priorities of other people in other positions in this business, when you say to them, look, this is your role, you've got to try to maximize this objective and this outcome. Why? Because we as a collective entity need to get to this place and what you're doing achieves this, which together with that person's job and that person's job, that person's job all combined to get us there. Now the person has a bigger picture and doesn't just see what they do as everything, They see what they do as part of something bigger, which is going to increase cooperation, etc., etc., etc. So when we see the material world as being a part of something enormous, that gives some perspective and allows the priority of the world to fall, of materialism to fall into place rather than taking over everything. So... That spiritual development is learning about the importance of the bigger picture of the purpose of spirituality and the fact that materialism is really just an outcome, a natural outcome of a lack of awareness of the full truth. It makes you kind of think, well, that's kind of stupid, isn't it? If the whole existence of the material world is, in a sense, to a degree, an outcome of a lack of awareness of the truth, why would you want that? Let's get aware of the truth and just kind of move away from that entirely. And in a sense, that is a very big, a large part of spiritual personal development and of what we're here for. But at the same time, we have to remember that all of that revolves around the ultimate objective of the material world, making material divine. If God didn't want specifically for material to be divine, he wouldn't have bothered creating all the way down to the bottom to make a physical world. He would have made something spiritual and stopped. Make some angels, they can sing to him all day and everybody's happy. Why all the layers down, down, down to a physical world? Because that's the ultimate objective. The process stops when you reach your objective. Now, we're going to go a little deeper for a second. 
if the only thing we don't have that much time for a change, surprise. Um, everything that exists is created by the creator, by God. God is the only thing, the only entity, let's say, that must exist by definition. Everything else exists because the creator decides to make it exist. Voluntarily. If the creator wanted or chose to not make things exist, there would be nothing except the creator. The creator exists by definition, which means the only true existence that something has, the only true existence is the creator. The truest value, the deepest and truest value something can have is the value that it has in terms of its relationship with the creator, because that's the source of all true value. Which means that the thing that's closest to the creator's heart is going to be the thing that is the most truly valuable. All the layers of spiritual reality, the angels, spirituality, etc. are means to an end to get down here. It's all because God wants a dwelling place in the physical world with physical objects, physical reality. So if the physical reality is the thing that's closest to the creator's heart, so to speak, obviously the creator doesn't have a heart, but it's an expression. The thing that's the the most deeply important, excuse me, to the creator, then that means that's the thing that's actually the most truly valuable and the thing that has the strongest life force. Because if the creator is, if the creator is the creator, which is what we're calling it, then everything's created by the creator, which means everything's existence in life comes from the creator, which means the more the creator is invested in something, the more alive it's going to be and the stronger a source of life it will be. The thing that's closest to the creator's heart is the material world. That's the purpose of all of spirituality is to get here. Granted so that we can bring the spirituality, divinity, godliness and God into this physical world, <clears throat> but it's specifically about the physical world. So, which means that the phys- on one hand, the physical world is the thing that's closest to the creator's heart. On the other hand, the defining element of physical reality is the least awareness, the most reduced awareness of the bigger picture. So, now that we see the world through the perspective of this reduction in awareness, spirituality is seems more true let's say perhaps loosely speaking than physical world physical reality and becoming more aware of that truth of the bigger picture of spirituality and the relationship between spirituality and the physical world etc is going to lead us to be more spiritually aware more spiritually developed and to have less of a priority on materialism which is a positive thing. But at the same time, the Baal Shem Tov says, the Torah is telling you, don't think that means that you should abuse your body, punish your body. Let your body struggle and say, yeah, Torah mitzvah is tough, good, suffer. Right? So we used to say as kids, I used to say with my friends as kids. Uh, maybe it's an Australian thing. But, right? Don't think that that's right. No. Get out there and help your body. Why? Because the whole point of it all is for the body. To the extent that because the body, the physical reality, has the strongest, deepest connection to the creator's heart, when Mashiach comes and we're actually aware of the full big picture, the whole big picture, we're going to see that the thing that has the strongest life force out of everything is physical reality. The body actually, in a sense, has a stronger connection to the creator than the soul does. Because everything's about material reality at the end of the way. And spirituality is a means to get here. So every single material thing that exists actually has, to some degree, a greater life force, spiritual life force, godly life force, than spirituality. God's actually technically more interested in the wood of this desk than in an angel. The desk is further away. But the angel was created as a means to get here. So this is the objective. This is what God really cares about. When we do a mitzvah, 
a physical mitzvah, tefillin, we put a coin in a charity box, we help someone eat, we eat ourselves and say a bracha, whatever it is, there are so many things we do. Mitzvahs by definition involve the physical world because that's the whole point. The point's not angels, the point's not just the spiritual element of prayer. If you pray and you and, and the prayer is just experiential and you don't say the words with your mouth, you haven't actually fulfilled the halachic requirement of prayer. If you study Torah experientially, but you don't say the words, if you meditate about the Kabbalistic meaning of tefillin and Shabbos candles, but you don't actually do the physical mitzvah, you've done 0% mitzvah. If you fulfill the mitzvah physically with zero meditation, you've done 100% mitzvah. Obviously, with the meditations is even better. But the definition of a mitzvah is a physical action because the whole point is the physical world. And so it's important to keep a priority and say, it, we're not here to break the body. Obviously, we're not here to just indulge and encourage materialistic indulgence, but we are here to work with the body and say, you're not here to break the body, work with the body. If your body needs a break, if your body's struggling, work with it, figure out what it needs to be healthier, figure out what it needs to, needs to be able to do the job better and happily and comfortably and work with it because that's what it's all about. That's why Hashem said to Avram, to the soul, whatever the body tells you, listen. Because the body at the end of the day is actually more important than the soul is. The physical world is more important than the spiritual is. And that's why when Sarah, when the body passed away, the soul cries. Avram cried and mourned when Sarah passed away. Yes, the soul's free of the limitations of the body, but it also has lost the ability to fulfill the purpose of all existence. All existence, physical and spiritual, exists to uplift the material world and make it divine and bring God into the physical world. So when the body dies, the soul's going to cry. That's it. I, I can't achieve anymore. I've lost my ability to fulfill the purpose of existence. Okay, so that's a good question. That's why in the very beginning I was saying it's very context specific. So it... In terms of examples, it becomes very, there's obviously not going to be one general answer, right? So generally speaking, the examples that I will often give is if a person feels like they're getting run down, working too hard, starting to feel a little bit taxed, a little bit, you know, unhappy, take a break. Maybe you need to hang out with some friends. Maybe you need to eat some good food. Maybe you need to do some exercise. Maybe you need some time out. If you're doing that to help your body, then that's what we're here for. Now, obviously... For some people, just for example, there are going to be certain kinds of food which make the body feel even better, which are prohibited. So anything that's prohibited according to Torah <clears throat> obviously means that it's not one of the things we're supposed to do to work with the body. As soon as something's in the gray area, it becomes very complicated. Um, and also keeping in mind, for example, and this is important, that even halachically there are things... It, is there, I just want to open the door in case there's a teacher waiting, because I'm happy to go as long as I'm not holding. So, sorry? Oh, okay. So if anyone wants to get up and go, like class is officially over, but I'm going to keep talking as long as I'm not holding anyone else up. Um, sorry. Um, so Torah itself, for example, when it comes to health, right? People say you're obligated to break Shabbos to save someone's life. You're not technically, strictly speaking, actually obligated to break Shabbos to save someone's life. Because if it's to save someone's life, you're not breaking Shabbos, you're honoring Shabbos. Because Shabbos says, yes, do that thing you're not usually allowed to do to save that person's life. Right? So when, let's say, Pekuach Nefesh demands something, that's not going against Torah. That's working with Torah. Anytime that something in that specific context is prohibited, that means it's not the thing that we're supposed to do. Um, so when I say comfortable, it doesn't just mean to indulge and feel good. It means comfortable, healthy. And, you know, this gets very complicated because I guess one of the biggest struggles probably in life to different degrees of intensity for probably everyone is the balance between comfort and challenge, right? The things that make me feel good versus the things that I'm doing, which are what I'm supposed to do and getting me to where I'm going to be, which generally tend to be less comfortable than hanging out and eating chips and reading a book or scrolling through Instagram, right? But that's just the way it works. So when I said comfortable, perhaps that wasn't a good choice of words. Um, but healthy and grounded and, and able to, to do what we're supposed to do 
with energy and with joy. Um, <clears throat> you know, and, and it, it, it can get very complicated because the question is, you know, am I doing this now to take care of myself because I need it or am I kind of indulging and just convincing myself? And it's not always so black and white. And you know what? We live and we try and we make mistakes. And then we look back and go, you know what? I didn't really need that. That was kind of a bad call. And I'll try to do a better call next time. You know, that this is life. This is what we're here for. Um, and now I think there's someone waiting. I hope that was helpful in clarifying. Um, and.